Hey everybody, in a previous video I took you over the steps for provisioning a PGX using the pay-as-you-go payment model. Today I'm going to be diving a little bit deeper into the network architecture for this setup. My name is Miguel Mendoza and I hope you're going to learn something today. Let's start by doing a little bit of whiteboarding. I'm going to recap all the steps that I went through and I'm going to create a visual diagram that will better explain the networking model. Let's jump over to the whiteboard. This is not going to be the prettiest diagram, but I promise if you follow along, you will gain a better or deeper understanding of the APGX network architecture. So the very first thing I did was that I created a GCP project and I named it my APG PayD demo. Then from the cloud console, I went to the APGX setup wizard and eventually I got to the step for creating an organization. Once this step was completed, basically what happens behind the scenes is that Google spins up the APG control plane. And behind the scenes, it's actually a multi-tenant system. So your control plane is actually sharing infrastructure with other APGX tenants, but you have a dedicated space within there for your APGX organization. Once the control plane was ready, the next step in the provisioning process was to begin doing the networking. In order to do that, first I needed to have a VPC network created within my project. So I went ahead and created a new VPC network from scratch, which I called APG Net. Within this VPC network, I also created a subnet that I called APG Subnet. Now, this subnet is not really required for this step. It's just that in order to create the VPC, you have to have at least one subnet, at least when you're creating it from the UI. Okay, so I have a new VPC network, but that is not enough to complete the networking step. In addition to the VPC network, this step also requires you to allocate two IP address ranges. One is a slash 22 cider range, and the other one is a slash 28 cider range. The slash 22 is used by the APG runtime and the slash 28 is reserved for APG support in case they need to do some troubleshooting in the future. The provisioning wizard gave me two choices. I could either pre-create these IP ranges myself or I could let the wizard dynamically allocate them based on the IP space available within my VPC network. And that is in fact what I did. If we go to my cloud console and jump to VPC networks, we can see within the APG Net VPC, within private service connection, here's the two ranges that the wizard allocated. First, we have the slash 22 for the runtime and the slash 28 for APG support. Let's go ahead and copy these values to update the diagram. All right, so let's put the two sided ranges. We have the slash 22 and the slash 28. I'm going to abbreviate them as R sider for runtime cider and S cider for support cider. Let's put it in here within the VPC network. At this point, I had all the necessary information to complete the networking step. So I just clicked on the create button and it finished successfully. But what actually happened behind the scenes? Let me explain. Behind the scenes, there's another project which is managed by Google. And this project is usually referred to as the service networking host. This project itself has a VPC, which is appropriately named service networking. So what this step actually is doing behind the scenes is that it creates a peering connection between the VPC in your project and the VPC in the Google managed project, the service networking host.
Also, these two sided ranges, they are made available within this peering connection. If we go back to the cloud console and go under VPC network peering, we can take a look at the peering connection and see the two parts of it. On the left side, we have the APG net network, which is in my project. And on the right side, we have the service networking VPC, which is in the other project. And here is the name of that other project. Let me copy this and update the diagram. So far, we've seen the architecture up to the networking step in the setup wizard. Now, let's go to the runtime step and see how the architecture changes. Here's where things get a little bit more complex, but also more interesting. And once you get to understand this really well, it will serve you as a foundational block for building more complex network architectures within your Google Cloud organization that make use of APGX. In order to create a runtime instance, the wizard needs two pieces of information from a networking point of view. First, it needs to know what Google Cloud region is going to be used, and also it needs to know what's the IP cider range that's going to be used for the runtime. Why does it want to know this runtime cider again? Didn't I just explicitly allocate a slash 22 in the previous step? Well, here's the thing. The peering connection can have many other side ranges associated with it. So we need to be explicit and tell it, hey, this specific slash 22 is the one that I want to use for spinning up the APG runtime. Or alternatively, you can also tell the wizard to look for the first available slash 22 within the peering connection and it will use that. So we have a region and we also have a runtime cider. How is this used behind the scenes? Let me explain. One of the very first things that happens is that a new subnet is created within the service networking VPC network. Now, I don't know the exact name of this subnet, but I know that this is going to be on the US Central 1 region. So I'm just going to give it this name. And the side range is going to be the slash 22 that I told the wizard to use. The next thing that happens behind the scenes is that a third GCP project gets created. This GCP project is also Google managed. Actually, let me go ahead and make it clear in this diagram all the components that are managed by Google. So we have this GCP project that I will explain in a second. This is Google managed. We have the service networking host, which is also Google managed. and the control plane, which is also Google managed. All right, so let's come back here to this project. This project is usually referred to as the APG tenant. So let me just go ahead and give it this name for now, APG tenant. Next, behind the scenes, the provisioning process spins up a Kubernetes cluster within the APG tenant project. Now, I do not know the exact name of this cluster, but I know that it's running on the US Central 1 region. So I'm just going to call it US Central 1 Kubernetes. This cluster has all the APG runtime components running in it. Also, all the worker nodes for this Kubernetes clusters, or for this Kubernetes cluster, they're getting IP addresses from this subnet right here. Next, there's an internal regional load balancer that also gets created within the APG tenant project. This load balancer is responsible basically for providing ingress access to the Kubernetes cluster that has the APG runtime. The IP address for this load balancer also comes from this same subnet. And that's basically what happens when you spin up an APG runtime instance. If we go to the APG UI under admin instances, we can see the details of this runtime instance. Here's the region and here's the IP address of the load balancer. Actually, let me go ahead and copy this and update the diagram so that it's got that information. Unless you're a Google Cloud networking expert, 
it probably is still not fully clear how can you communicate with this internal load balancer from the APG Net BPC. Let me try to explain. When you create a peering connection between two BPC networks, routes are usually automatically exchanged for each of the subnets within those BPCs. What that means is that this side arrange in here will be imported as a route into the APG Net BPC and the side arrange for this subnet will be exported as a route into the service networking BPC. Essentially, this allows bidirectional communication between workloads running in this project and workloads running within this project through this peering connection. Let's see what that looks like in the Cloud Console. If we go into the peering connection, we should see that there is an imported route for the APG runtime. This is in fact the IP range for this subnet right here. And we should also see that there is an exported route in this region for this IP range, which is in fact the IP range for this subnet. Actually, let me go ahead and update the diagram right now. Also, if we look at the route table, we should see that within this route table, if we want to access an IP address within this range, the next hop is the peering connection, which means that workloads running within this project within the APG Net BPC are able to communicate with workloads running in this project through this peering connection. Let's go back to the provisioning wizard. In the next step, environment, I created a group called dev and an environment called default dev. Let me update the diagram with that information. So basically in the control plane, we now have two new resources. We have the group itself, which is called dev, and under that group, we have the environment, which is called default dev. And the relationship here is that a group can contain one or more environments, and this one only contains the default dev environment. Now the group also uh, has a host name or one or more host names attached to it. So in this case, the, the provisioning wizard only asked me to provide one, so that's what I did. And I can go ahead and actually grab it from the UI. So let me go back over here. So if we go under environments, groups, here's the host name that I used. So let's put it here. Great, and this is basically the side effects in the control plane, but there's also side effects from the point of view of networking. The provisioning wizard also took the environment, default dev, and it attached it to the runtime instance that was created in the previous step. So what does that mean from a networking point of view? Well, what it means is that now this Kubernetes cluster has gateway nodes that are responsible for handling traffic that come to API proxies deployed to the default dev environment. Not only that, but because this default dev environment is associated with the dev group that has this host name, there is routing rules within this Kubernetes cluster that make it so that only traffic that comes with the host name matching this value can be routed to API proxies within the default dev environment. At this point, this is a fully working APGX setup, but with the limitation that traffic can only originate from the APG Net BPC. In the next step in the provisioning wizard, we're asked whether we want to keep it that way or if we want to enable external access. In my case, I chose to enable external access. At that point, the wizard then asked me for information that it needed in order to spin up infrastructure within my GCP project that would allow external access into the APG runtime. It asked me to provide a subnet within the APG Net BPC, a host name, and a certificate. How was this information used? In order to understand that, let's look at what actually happened behind the scenes. The provisioning wizard first creates a managed instance group within my GCP project. What is this managed instance group? A managed instance group is really just a set of virtual machines that are created from a predefined template. This group itself can scale up or down based on some predetermined conditions such as percentage of CPU usage. 
The network interfaces for the VMs in this group are configured to get IP addresses from the APG subnet that I created very early on. For example, each of the VMs within the group are going to get IP addresses like 1, 2, etc. Also, whenever a new VM comes up within this group, there is a script that automatically adds an IP tables rule that basically takes any traffic that arrives on port 443 and forwards it to the IP address of the internal load balancer also on port 443. Technically, the managed instance group is acting as a network bridge in front of the internal load balancer, which itself is pointing to the APG runtime. But why do we need this at all? Well, the reason is that if we want to expose the APG runtime for external traffic, we need a global load balancer. And the global load balancer is not able to transit through the peering connection and reach this internal load balancer. Instead, we need to point the global load balancer to the managed instance group. Let's go to the cloud console and see what this looks like. We'll go to instance groups and we see here that there's one instance group. This was created by the provisioning wizard. And within this group, there's two instances. This means two virtual machines. Each of these virtual machines was created from this template. Let's take a look at the template. The network interface for each of the VMs in the group is going to be attached to the APG subnet. Also, under custom metadata, we have these two properties. First, we have startup script URL. This instructs Compute Engine so that it runs this script when a VM comes up in this group. The script itself has instructions to create an IP tables rule that forwards all traffic on port 443 to this IP address also on port 443. And remember, this is the IP address of the internal load balancer that points to the APG runtime. Next, let's take a look at the load balancer that was created by the provisioning wizard. The front end has an IP address that is public and externally reachable, and the back end is pointing to the APG managed instance group. Also, the back end is configured with an HTTPS health check that targets a special path in the APG X runtime. There's no API proxy that's receiving calls for this path. It is the ingress on the backend itself that replies to requests targeting this. For this health check to work correctly, the firewall in the APG Net VPC needs to be configured to allow the global load balancer inbound access on port 443. Let's take a look at that in the firewall rules. This is the rule that makes this happen. You can see that there's two IP ranges where the calls from the global load balancer are going to be coming from. This rule itself was created by the provisioning wizard. You can see that it only targets VMs with this tag, which are the ones in the managed instance group. Also, these two IP addresses, these are not arbitrary. These are documented to be the source IPs for the Google Cloud global load balancers. Well, folks, this is it for the video. My hope is that you can use this information as the foundational block for when you go on to build more complex architectures using APGX. If you found this information useful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.